Okay, we are live, and here's a little bit of Res Band, Resurrection Band. We're going to get started here. So uh, we're going to rock them out, and we're going, to f we're going to see how long it takes them to close the doors. All right, first thing, uh, we're going to hit a lot of Christian. Oh, there it is. Already. Them already. Look at that. Um, Are you afraid? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, so handouts. Did everyone get a handout back there? It's like five pages long or whatever. Um, do you want one? Can someone grab a handout real quick, and then we'll just bring it over and be a little quicker? Um, so we're not going to, at the very beginning, we're going to hit a lot of this just hard rock stuff. Most of these bands are a little edgier. Some of them do, you know, those kind of ballads, rock ballads, and they seem really soft. But for the most part, it's going to be hard rock stuff and that kind of thing, uh, or alternative rock. We cannot do justice to any of these bands, unfortunately, you know. So I gave, a, I gave a much more extensive list in the handout, and even those can't do justice totally. But uh, feel free to go home and go hunting and check them out if you like the, the bands. So we're going to begin with Petra. Mark, do you like Petra? 
Sure, let's, let's talk about Matt. Matt's not going to be on camera right now, but Matt, go ahead and uh, pick up your mic and tell us who you are. He's a guest with us today. It's on, yeah. Test. Yeah, we're on. There you go. Yes, um, my name is Matt Rice. Um, I used to play, it sounds like an AA meeting. I was <laughs> a Christian rock person. Yeah. I played in a band in the 80s called Legacy. And um, so we actually, some of these bands here tonight, we... Uh, played with Mylan and um, Res Band and some different groups we did concerts with and opened with and did some dates with. So When were you starting? What's that? When were you starting playing? Oh, when did I personally start playing? Yeah, No, just with, when did the band start doing the Christian oh, rock scene? We, um, so we started a band in 1987. Okay. Um, and then we had, and I left about three and a half years after that, because the 90s, you know, yeah. I went to Bible college and okay. uh, went down a different path. But uh, during that period of time, 87 to like 1990, uh, we played in our garage. Uh, yeah. Garages in a little church called Grace Chapel, James Meacham. I don't know if anybody knows him, Pastor Meacham. Uh, his son was our singer, so we practiced there. And um, and then Karen, who's not here tonight, yeah. her husband Rich, uh, got us in uh, New Year's Eve uh, to open for Milan Res Band wow. at uh, the Ohio Center. Wow. And we had just recorded and financed a six-song EP. We were 18, 19-year-old kids. That's amazing. Wrote all original music, and then we found ourselves on that platform, and that kind of opened a lot of doors. And then we played the Cornerstone Festival, toured some with Sacred Warrior, and then did, um, I won't share all of it, but may maybe later, mm -hmm. uh, did a local battle of the bands at the Hour of Sevilla, awesome. which was a secular you know, okay. uh, rock club. And so we went in, we just wanted to preach. We didn't think we'd win. So it was a three. Uh, it was three different uh, sessions. Won the first round, second round, and we ended up winning it. Wow! So it opened up so many doors. We we went back and played there. We preached. We preached right in the bar, and I think we ended up drawing fifteen hundred, two thousand people, and people came from Cincinnati, Cleveland, and it's kind of a mixed bag because it was a bar. So we had Christians coming in, but they knew we were coming in to evangelize. So I gave altar calls on the stage. Uh, on the very stage where, if you follow the rock history, Dime, Dimebag Daryl. Dimebag Daryl. Uh, mm -hmm. He died on the stage. I, I played right on that mm. spot that he was shot in wow. years ago. Yep. And um, so the owner, Rick Catella, at that time loved us. And he said, it's the only band I'll let my 16-year-old daughter come see. Wow. Uh, but he said, I can't have you back because I'm not selling anything at the bar. <laughs> but he <laughs> loved us because we preached the gospel. And so he had, you know, this struggling type of faith. Uh, but we saw people getting saved right there in the bars afterwards, kids coming up weeping and crying because of they were away from God. So it was a, a unique time. So we did that, and we kind of knocked on the door of some Christian record deals and <clears throat> ended up having a song put out on Heavy Righteous Metal. It was an uh, album uh, after our Cornerstone Festival uh, that mm -hmm. we played. Uh, we came in second there, which was the big festival in Chicago mm -hmm. where everybody played. So we were in the new band showcase, and came in second and kind of won that secondary deal and uh, so that came out and you wow. know you could find it online for 50 cents plus uh, you do know. you have any stuff on YouTube then that we yep. can access maybe we'll, we'll link to it in the description uh, uh, yeah so we have uh, or if you go to iTunes okay uh, we had a guy that saw us play Cornerstone in 2000 I'm sorry 1990 1989 geez. and um, said if I ever start a record company I want Legacy to be on it so he started a record company in 2010 a little indie label Long story short, found us, took all of our old music and financed it and, and put it out. Great. So it's out on uh, iTunes. Good. We'll link to it in the yeah. description. Just and we got a new yeah. song we're working on. I was just in the studio oh, last okay. night till 1030 and uh, putting the final touches on a uh, legacy, you know, the, the uh, midlife crisis tour. There is, you go. There you go. Sponsored by Metamucil. And, uh, <laughs> of course. <laughs> but and, it's good, man. And, we're having fun. And, and uh, you know, just kind of doing it for fun. And uh, it's, you know, I think we're, we're playing pretty good. For a bunch of fifty-year-old guys. Well, it's great to have Matt here. He's gonna. He has some other stories, I'm sure, to share along the way. So, um, yeah, good stuff. Let's get started. Um, Petra. Yeah. 
give us life that can make us grow that can make the love between us flow you say you've been feeling weaker weaker by the day you say you can't make the joy of your salvation stay the good things come to them that wait Not to those who hesitate So hurry up and wait upon the Lord More power to you When you're standing on His word When you're trusting with your whole heart In the message you have heard More power to you That wait upon the Lord, they shall renew, they shall renew their strength. We are strangers, we are aliens, we are not of this world. There's even some backmasking uh, scandals somewhere in the mid '80s that Petra was like, "Well, we're gonna, you know, a whole concern about this." Well, Petra deliberately backmasked, uh, put some backmasking in their their music to kind of to kind of go against it. So, Petra, there we go with Petra. Um, again, come on, that can't really cover '80s Petra, but it does for now. Thoughts on Petra? I know, Mark, you have some thoughts. Your favorite band of all time, maybe? They are. They have the best lyrics of all time as well. I think very strong, uh, biblically based lyrics. If you really listen to a lot of the Petra music, it's, it's very sound. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. You seen them in concert? Anyone seen Petra in concert? Oh, gee, okay. Apparently, I've missed out. So, all right. So, this is going to have to happen sometime, Mark. It's going to have to happen. Oh, boy. I haven't kept up, you can tell, right? Yeah. So, yeah, Mark. They were good. Fun fact, uh, when Greg X. Foles left and they were looking for a new lead singer, my youth group convinced me to send in a demo tape. You did? <laughs> yeah. Nice. So what did you sing for the demo? Uh, I'm trying to remember which track it was now. Um, Let me look 
Because right? it was one of the ones you just played. Can you give us a sample? I think it was uh, that. <laughs> More power to you, I think, was the one I... Nice. Came in, yeah. Nice. Petra, see, here's my Petra story. Um, Mount Vernon, I'm from Mount Vernon. I was in the gospel supply shop where you buy all of your music, downtown Mount Vernon. It still exists today, actually. And uh, I remember I was just getting into buying CDs, and um, my dad, I was there deciding on a few CDs, and I wanted to get No Doubt by Petra. It was one of the, it was the green looking kind of cover. Uh, begins with a great track, Enter In, and we will definitely play that track when we get to the 90s. I remember my dad thinking he just wasn't very happy that I chose Petra. And I just remember, like he, he kind of didn't want me to choose the, the rock and CD. So I remember that because it was kind of the first time he allowed me to buy that kind of rock, uh, Christian as it was. Um, and also, but I also remember that there's a little bit of that tension. I think a lot of parents had that, especially I imagine in the 80s where it was even more cutting edge. I don't know, does anyone have any stories of like the controversy around bands like Petra? Yeah, uh, go ahead, Mark. Matt. Uh, it's kind of funny. Um, so we weren't allowed to listen to regular rock and roll. Right. And um, so we wanted to listen to Christian rock. And I grew up Assemblies of God. And at that time, Jimmy Swagger was really preaching pretty hard against these types of things. So yeah. my dad wasn't convinced. My mom wanted to find something we could listen to. So we went down to the record store, and my mom purchased the... Uh, more power to you. No, I'm sorry, never say die. Okay. Uh, so she told us now, listen, don't play this until I can smooth this over with your dad. <laughs> that was the story. So what did we do? We went home and put it on the, re on, on the record player and just cranked it up. Nice. He walks in, and there was a song they sang uh, called Killing My Old Man. <laughs> so <laughs> killing my old man. It was just singing Killing My Old Man. And he looked, what is this? And yep. we had no clue. You know, yeah. I, I didn't understand the theological nuances at that time. And so we had no answer for it. So right. he, uh, he took the record and put it in the closet and um, prayed about it. And then about a couple, uh, about a week later, he released it and let it out. And then, of course, uh, we ended up, you know, doing what we did and growing our hair out and playing places. And, but, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that was the original uh, Petra story that we mm -hmm. uh, almost, almost didn't get that opportunity. Wow. Dad would get mad, not so much at Petra, but when I got into the heavier stuff like Striper, Res Band, and yeah. Bride. And, and I would take the cassette, pull out the, and they would have the biblical references, and I'd yeah. be reading them, I'm like, look, Dad, nice. <laughs> right there, Psalms, whatever. And he'd be like, oh, well, you can't hear him, you can't understand him. You know, I'm like, well, but it's right here, I'm telling you. But yeah, I had a big struggle with that. Well, yeah. I'm on the opposite. Right. So when I was 12, it was my 12th birthday, and uh, my parents and the district you're, you're superintendent. Your mom and dad are watching online. No, they're not. Okay. My yeah. <laughs> they don't know how to operate the. <laughs> anyway, no. So when I was 12, 12 or 13, uh, my parents and Dr. Stone, which was the RDS in Indiana where we lived in uh, NEI, was um, they bought me a CD player, and then my very first CD was the big four-disc Petra set. So that was like. Well, Alan's always been a student of pop music, um, contemporary pop. That's our ne like. This is my life. Yeah. Like literally, from this was my like yeah. everything on the sheet. So, um, so I was. It was the opposite with us, where it was. Here is this, and my introduction was not from anything, but you know, Alan Ador gave me that. Probably not. Mom so much was happy about it, but she's not happy about anything. But it's definitely Alan. That's on the record now, too, yeah. And Just kidding. So, yeah, so Petra, uh, we talk about, you talk about Striper. We, let's do some Striper, because we have lots of more controversy with Striper, okay? Let's get some Striper in here. So, you might notice, this is their second album, I believe. Oh, okay.
a big Metallica guy, so. Thoughts on Striper before we continue? We have a ton of music, so, but thoughts on Striper, <clears throat> besides how amazing it is. Do you have something, or you, Sheila? Loving mom. Mm. Um, I came in the house and I was little and I heard her listening to this one. And I was like, what are you doing? What's going on? She's like, no, no, seriously. It's Christian. I'm like, no, there's no way. What are you doing? She got it out. I'm like, there's money on the cover. Um, and so she, she had a talk with me that, oh, no, this is really Christian. I had a hard time believing her when I was little. How old were you at the time? I don't know. I was little. So you were the moral Maybe. compass in your family then, right? <laughs> Apparently, yeah. I was like, what are you doing, Mom? Oh, you just gave you me Michael W. Smith to listen to. <laughs> you're listening to some heavy rock band. Nice. So I thought it was interesting that it's Christian who really loves him. It's, you know, in, in the early 80s, I, I graduated from college in 83, and my first... Uh, my first pastor was a youth pastor up in, in Cleveland, Ohio, and my kids were the ones that introduced me to like Petra and Striper and Res Band and, and things like that. And so, you know, that, that was my first introduction to it. Before that, you know, the Imperials were, you know, they, they were of the devil. <laughs> you know, this was, a, this was the next level up, you know. So, and, uh, you know, but... Um, yeah, so th those kids, you know, they, they introduced me to all that, and you too, you know. Nice. Yeah, so. Yeah, a lot of times you get the bag. <laughs> That's this one thing parents were concerned, you get the baggage along with you, get the all the striper, and while you're at it, Slayer's Rain and Blood 1986 is pretty killer too, you know? You know what I'm saying? You get a little bit of that. Do you have any thoughts right now? Or? <clears throat> kind of living through this, and this was the band that influenced us, you know, the yeah. most. We were kind of on that side of it, but um, it it's hard for people who weren't there maybe to understand the times too because the whole heavy metal scene was dark. I mean, mm -hmm. it was occultic. Um, and these guys came out legitimate Christian. And I've tried to tell my kids about it because we went to see, I see them still, they'll come around and we'll go see them. But to, to go in the arenas in that day, there, there was a, the only way to describe, there was a power of God that you felt in that arena when they got up and began to preach Christ to a crowd that was really, I mean, mostly unconverted heavy metal kids, and they mm -hmm. preached it boldly, and and they were kind of the first legitimate yeah. crossover uh, Christian band because thoroughly Christian, uh, but they weren't playing in churches. So the rest of us, we were playing in churches and kind of a mix of things. They were playing the biggest arenas of the day, uh, opening and then having some of the bigger bands open for them. But it was just the, they really made, they cut through that whole dark time and with yeah. a message of Christ that I knew personally a lot of people who experienced the presence of God were born again and really uh, came to Jesus through that band. And it was very controversial, yeah. but the other side was mm -hmm. I, I know people to this day walking with Jesus uh, because they came mm -hmm. into contact with him through one of these concerts. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, just a little, s s the back masking, just going back to the, talking about the dark days, the opening of Slayer's second album, Hell Waits, is backmasking. Join us, join us. This is demonic, join us. Now, of course, Slayer's playing this up too. They're just trying to do that. They're not Satan worship. They they pl clearly played to the satanic mode and backmasked in satanic gestures. And they had, you know, a whole bunch. Everything about Slayer, for instance, which is right in this era. Slayer's biggest album, Rain and Blood, 1986, is the same year as To Hell with the Devil. And so you see that there's almost this dialogue where Striper is saying, I hear you, Slayer, or Megadeth, or whoever it would be, and I'm going to, you know, so, yeah. I'll, I want to skip to Bride, because we want to complete some of this heavy stuff, and I know Greg really wants this. Not a lot of Bride, but um, how about... Uh, in concert.
really, there is, this is fun in its own way, but we, we, what is it? We won't go to hell. No, we won't go. You can read it a lot of ways, but we, the gang vocal aspect gets to gets mm -hmm. the, say the phrase. So it's kind of fun yep. that way. Um, while we're here, King yeah, Zach. Yeah, the comma was silent. Yeah. <laughs> King's X has a lot of other good tracks. I recommend uh, a lot of those other tracks I listed. One thing on Bride, if you're looking on that page, you might notice their first album is called Show No Mercy. That's actually the 1986 album. That's the, the title of Slayer's first 1983 album, Show No Mercy. Uh, interesting. So there, there's a little bit of an inversion in a play, right? So Show No Mercy, uh, they're, they're just grabbing the same title. I haven't looked at the album cover recently, but they're, they're definitely not unaware of Slayer's first album, right? So, uh... And Bride, and especially those two, to me, was the lyrics were so raw and, like, in your face, like, as a teenager. And you kind of touched on the one guy from the 70s. The hip, kind of the hippie kind of guy oh, that was Randy preaching, Matthews, yeah. yeah. And I mean, these things were hearing me like songs about abortion oh, yeah. that were graphic, describing the effects of on you when you would do this. Like she don't get her picture made no more. Was a, was a just. I mean, I remember being just hit by this stuff. Like, man, my pastor doesn't talk about this stuff. I don't hear this stuff in youth group. This is band, mommy don't love daddy anymore. There's a title. That's it's right straight to, you know. Yeah, let's do some res band while we're here. Now they changed kind of to become res a little bit more here uh, in this album, but uh, we listened to some of them on the way in. He said that he had your number. You cut the telephone line. You said you needed a reason. He said that he had much time. You kept trying to avoid it. He kept knocking on the door. Put it in all the way, but it's really good when she comes yeah. in. It's really good. All right, we, we got to do some other stuff. All right, so let's move on. Uh, change pace for a little bit. We'll come back. We got to hit Carmen. Okay, guys, Carmen happened. Okay, and he's not cutting edge initially, but as he gets into the 90s, he's going to start doing rap and he's going to start being more aggressive with his phrases. And you might even say even more obnoxious with his phrases. He has an addicted to Jesus album. It's like, and it's an ugly, it's a terrible rap song, but, but you know what I'm saying? Like, he becomes a little more all-in edgy as he progresses. But he's starting out, as you can see here, um, let's get Carmen going. On Friday night, they crucified like the Lord at Calvary. But he said, don't dread, in three days, I'm gonna live again. Sundays on the way. Oh, that was not what I wanted to do. 
things. The things. See, man, I, I watched him confront the Pharisees. All right, let's I was there when he yeah, fed the 5,000. Lazarus, come forth. I heard the people gasp when he healed the lame. You see, man, I even remember the littlest things, the things most folks would forget, like the simple, loving way he just called my name. Up at the grave, the stone rolled away with a loud voice. Jesus started to say, You see, fellas, it just seemed like yesterday. I could hear that man stay in my As a matter of fact, it seemed like today I don't know. Lazarus. Excuse me, brothers. I, I think I hear him calling now. What? Lazarus. Jesus? Lazarus. Jesus? Lazarus. Jesus? Lazarus. Hey, Jesus? Lazarus. roared in victory, the saints shocked and perplexed as wounds appeared upon his hands and what feet. He does. Then Satan kicked him in his side and blood and water flowed and they waited for the ten count of defeat. God the Father turned his head, his tears announcing Christ was dead. The ten count would proclaim the battle's end. Then Satan trembled through his sweat in unexpected horror. Yet, as God started to count by saying, ten. Hey, hey wait a minute, God. Nine. You are counting wrong. Eight. His eyes are seven. His fingers are twitching. Six. Where's all this light coming from? Five. He's alive. Four. Carmen, you might notice like just like with Don Francisco, you have to have some patience. You, the, it's not just a quick hit; it's extended, and you got to be you got to be patient for it and listen for. The, and that's if you can have that patience, you can enjoy the trajectory. So, thoughts on Carmen? Has anyone seen Carmen? I imagine his show is amazing. Yeah, the, I mean the lights and the props and the costumes. I mean, I remember this when he came out with the boxing robe and the whole. Well, works. he he, had, I mean, he was one of the very first guys to have like legit music videos that told stories mm -hmm. that were equivalent to um, what they were playing on MTV. Where like all the rest of the stuff was like when MTV first came out, everybody was just like playing on the stage. Carmen was the first guy to actually move from that and actually have full legit movie theater or no movie theatric style productions. Yeah. <coughs> Other common, Carmen stories or thoughts? 
How many people had a Carmen album or? Oh yeah. Yeah. They, uh, I was telling Aaron earlier that I've seen him twice. I saw him once at the fair, uh, but then I saw him once at a at a concert, and I can't remember the venue it was at. It wasn't a real a real large one, but we had pretty good seats, and we were sitting on the on like the left hand side of the stage, and he entered the stage from coming from the back and walking up. And as they were introducing him, he stopped right beside me. And I was amazed at how short he was. Hmm. He is really short. <laughs> and I, I just didn't expect that, you know. And, and, uh, but it was a great concert, though. I mean, you know, because, I mean, we were right there. We could, you know, we're just from me to Greg, you know, to where he was at on the stage. And so it was, it was great. It was really neat. But he is really short. <laughs> I, I just couldn't believe that. Well, let's, let's hit some more music. We got a lot going on here. Um, Mylon Lefebvre, remember him? He's doing his stuff. He's got Mylon in his heart. A Grammy and a Dove Award. The Dove Award starts. Um, I'm going to pass Phil Kagey for now, but um, maybe at the end we'll hit him. Um, so many good music. It's hard to choose what, the, what is best. Town to Town, I just said a song. Uh, yeah, let's get in a second. Yeah, Phil Kagey had a few others. So just doesn't he look like, uh, what's his name? He looks a little bit like, uh, I don't even know now. Okay. Story, let's go. Mile. Back to my own story. Oh, he, he said, I got one. Oh, you got it. Let's do it. Uh, Phil looks like Chris Kalala. Is that you thinking? Oh, you mean, wow. No, I think it was, uh, I just the name just dropped me. Okay, okay. okay. Anyways, uh, Frank Zappa, a little bit. Right? A little Frank, Frank Zappa. Zappa. Yeah. 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 yeah, so we, uh, so we got to open for Island, and, uh, I think the thing that struck me, I, I saw a lot of these guys, and we played with a lot of these guys. I, I didn't meet anybody with a passion for souls like Mylon Lefevre, uh, probably of anybody. And he would, I remember, I think the concert we had opened up, he did a 40-minute ultra call. Wow. Uh, which was kind of controversial because people paid, right. you know, 20 bucks for the ticket. And he did not care. And he, when he drew in the net, I mean, there were hundreds uh, of young people that came forward for salvation. But his integrity and passion for souls was amazing and then he was good to us we were a young band we were 18 and 19 year old kids we had our shirts unbuttoned and you know because we thought we were rock stars and uh he sent a message he said tell them boys they can't go on my platform unless they button their shirts up so we buttoned wow, up pretty wow. quick there you go <laughs> but he was great afterwards sat with us talked with us poured into us and just super integrity presence of god and valued souls and uh i think one of the the greatest uh you know, Christian uh, examples in, in that whole era. Great man. And, you know, 
he's he's seen it all. Remember, if we're going back, he's starting in the late '60s. He's actually singing with the Lefevers gospel group much earlier than that. He's in the late he's in the '70s. He's a big rocker. He gets in with all the secular guys a little bit. Gets in the drugs. Gets in the problems, and he kind of remakes himself. And uh, so this is kind of his rearrival in the late '80s. I would say he's probably the only rocker that has a hymn in the hymn book. Oh, old gospel ship? No, no, <laughs> no not old gospel ship. What? His his first one. Um, oh shoot, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that first oh. one that that Elvis covered. Yeah, it made oh. me big. Mm, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll look it up and, yeah, get, that, and get that. I yeah. can't think of the name of it right now, but but. All right, let's go, let's go to Steve Taylor here. So, how many people have heard of Steve Taylor? Okay, some alternative rock stuff starting to happen. Okay, so it's not just. It's starting to get a little weird now. This is the first album. This music often is about Christians. I don't know so much about Christ all the time. But about Christ. I gone through so much other stuff that walking down the aisle was tough, but now I know it's not enough. I want to be a I asked the Lord into my heart, they said that was the way to start, but now you've got to play the part. I want to be a clone. Be a clone, get conviction, good night. Cloneliness is next to godliness, right? I'm grateful that they showed a way, cause I could never know the way to serve him on my own. I want to be a clone. She could be dancing lately, cheek to cheek While Midwest good old boys like me should all be playing catch up See some scrap to the village voice and throngs And guess who gives it Madam Wands Well drop your pens and pan designs And drop six words in your open minds Who we trying to kid, kid To the Hollywood school teaching everything's cool Who we trying to kid, kid To the Greenwich Mockingbird who has got to have the last word Got your head together now Got a way that's better now The 77s.
later on. records becomes a little more edgier stuff. You touch my hair and cheeks sometimes, feeling yourself this flesh and blood, my poor flesh and blood, my poor flesh and blood. I think I met an angel once, but I can't really know for sure. Do I know? difficult to determine how Big Christian bite. on the surface, right? Can I have a hope to get it right, can't get it right? Believe I've had a vision or two. Let's go to Mark Hurd.
Nature Boys. All right, so uh, we got a lot, a lot of music we went through there. Thoughts on a lot of these indie bands or kind of punk bands or new wave sounds, whatever. Some thoughts or stories. The Newsboys are going to be huge in the 90s. They're going to be huge. So they're getting kicked off, but that's a pretty great track for them to already have. They're from Australia, so it's going to be kind of that foreign influence with Christian music. Matt, do you have any thoughts on any of this this kind of alternative stuff? Or, um, yeah, it was really popular. It was. Yeah, I mean, okay. just in general, in the '80s, you had, you know, a couple different streams, and of course, we were kind of in that metal space over yeah. there. And, um, but I listened to all of it when I was, you know, I I, I grew up in the '80s as a teenager, so. Um, I remember listening to U2 yeah. back in 1983, mm -hmm. before anybody knew. I, I found it through a Christian magazine, this Irish Christian band, and ordered the, ordered the tape, the tape. Mm -hmm. You know, who talks about that anymore? Ordered the tape, came to my house, and, mm -hmm. and so I loved all that stuff. And, you know, kind of went a little different direction musically, but, yeah, all those guys were good. I mean, there was some great Christian music that stood up, I felt stood up uh, in any arena, mm -hmm. you know, whether secular artist, Christian artist, and... Um, those guys are really good. And, and, I mean, I grew up in the '80s, but I was, you know, I was a tiny, I was little, yeah. so I didn't experience that. But when I'm going back and listening, this was not on my adult contemporary Christian radio, and I was yeah. like, so I was like, well, Christian, that, all that music was, it was all that stuff, and I, I didn't realize how much good stuff. And so, oh, the, yeah. in the little bit of listening I've been able to do uh, recently, I've been really impressed with a lot of these oh, bands. Yeah. There's a lot of great bands, so, great songwriters, and great live performers. Yeah, uh, which you know you didn't have a lot of the stuff then that you have now the auto tune <laughs> things like that. Yeah, that's true. Used to, you know, so you had to play, and uh, yep. some of these bands were really good and and could put on a great live performance. And I, I think I I liked what you said about you know about you too. Yeah. Because, um, you know I I mentioned earlier that my youth group up up in uh, Willoughby Hills, Ohio, they're they're the ones that turned me on to you too. Yeah. And um, and I was amazed that you know because nobody was calling them a Christian band. Mm -hmm. They were a, they were a secular band, but but their their music yeah. really had a lot of biblical message to it. Yeah. All right, there was it was a, they were very moral yeah. in their in their messages, yeah. and uh, and you know the song forty that's from Psalm forty. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's just a, a lot of, of different ones. There's uh, Sunday Bloody Sunday. Yeah, sun, yeah, Wednesday. but there's there's one shoot, and I can't think of the name of it right now. But it's uh, from a passage in Isaiah mm. uh, that uh, was yeah. really powerful, and uh, you know, and so I was, yeah. you know, I was pleasantly surprised by that, yes. you know, because they were billed as a secular band yeah. all all the way around, and yet the, this message was a part of it, you know, and and get get understanding the uh, uh, the climate out of which they came in Northern Ireland you know it was it was really kind right. of kind of interesting how he was they were going to the Bible yes. you know to, to yeah. find 
the resource for their message. Yeah. So that yeah. was really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, and that's a the theme going on. There's going to be some bands like that that are ambiguously Christian, U2, Collective Soul, Creed. You know, some of those are going to become things, just to name a few. So let's, let's close out with at least one band here that's pretty big at times, doing a, a good mix of things. Garmo and Key. Uh, let the I said at the beginning, I've done no justice to a lot of these bands. Phil Keggy, we passed over almost completely. Um, White Heart. Oh my goodness, White Heart was huge. Mm -hmm. White Heart had a ton of stuff, okay? Um, just a few I had put up there, but we're not going to go into it. But a ton of stuff. I did list a lot. Um, White Cross is going to be another one of those heavier bands. This is going to win Dove Hard, Hard Music Album of the Year, a Dove Award. Um, and so White Cross is going to become a pretty good thing, pretty big band. Um, oh, there goes the, this is getting weird. So uh, check it out. And one thing you might notice on the handout, rap and hip hop. Okay, I, we obviously don't have time to do all that. But these early artists, when you're looking at that, that's, this is not popular this is very early and obscure, okay? It's very interesting to look into this. You see DC Talks beginning. MC Sweet or Mix Sweet, whatever, that is probably that 1982 single. That's right up there with maybe the first, and I don't know what the timing would be with that bad rap song. Those are both, I think, the same year. Um, that's like the earliest. And then Stephen Wiley's Bible Break, which is the most, these are, a lot of them are awful. They're totally awful. Go on YouTube and look up Stephen Wiley Bible Break. It is horrendous. Uh, but a lot of these are going to keep going, and they're going to get better into the 90s as rap gets better into the 90s, okay? Um, so interesting there. Lots of other pop rock there to, to listen. Obviously, you know, we've missed Thank You for Giving to the Lord, Ray Bolts, just uh, while we've been at it, and whatever else I left on. We didn't get into any hardcore rock did that, did that not print? It did. On other rock, on the page 
four or whatever. So there's five pages, page four. You know, some of the other aggressive bands, Deliverance, Vengeance Rising, Believer. Is that more in your wheelhouse or a little more, that's a little more death metal. You're more striper-like. But, you know, that's going to be, Tourniquet's going to start in the early 90s, you know. It's starting to become, we're going to get the growls and all that stuff going. And Vengeance Rising is pretty big. Uh, pretty well-produced uh, Christian hardcore metal, okay, and death metal kind of uh, stuff. Um, thrash metal is a word people would use. Metallica, Megadeth, Slayer, Anthrax are all thrash metal, and there's thrash stuff in Slayer. But truly the more aggressive metal like that would be your deliverance, your vengeance rising, believer. Um, so to kind of check that out. That's actually well-produced and, as a, just a note, Christian hardcore music has always been well-received in other venues. Uh, Norma Jean, I mean, just whatever these bands. A lot of these bands, uh, what are some of the other Christian bands? Well, Tourniquet's been well-received. Mortification, a lot of these have been, have done well. And just take a note on, I know we're getting later here, Remember how it's hard to distinguish the lyrics? We always heard about complaints of parents saying, you can't even tell what they're saying. Well, when they're growling and, and yelling into the microphone, you really can't tell unless you're really an insider. And I think that's part of the, what the culture is about. I know what it's about because I look at the lyrics and it's mine. You don't know what it's about. All you see is, and that is important to the identity of some of these subcultures. And... Uh, but there's a lot of legitimate music on the hardcore end. And so as we're looking at this stuff, it's more aggressive. It's not just like, oh, the Christians have their fun. A lot of the harder edge stuff was actually more respected, I think, on secular, in secular worlds. That's, I think, why Striper had more respect in secular worlds than, you know, the average Christian pop. So that's some of my thoughts. Concluding thoughts from us. We're finishing out the 80s here, and I know we left a lot, but thoughts before we go. Matt, you have something, maybe. The best era ever. Best era ever? Wow. I have I, to say that. I said it in the 70s when Don't we Don't tell my kids I said that. What's that? Don't tell my kids I said that. They'll there you fight go. me. Actually, they kind of, uh, you know, I guess every generation, when you're retro, you know you're old. When they're looking back, you know, your music is retro. Uh, but, yeah, it was a good era. It was a really yeah. good era. Everything kind of changed after that because the Christian secular labels started to disintegrate somewhere in the 90s. Mm. And then you had nobody wanted to be called a Christian band. They're Christians in a band. And, but I think in the 80s there was still kind of that dividing line. And um, there was an evangelistic type of thrust uh, that was really the purpose of a lot of bands that really we did it because we wanted to see souls saved. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of a unique type of time. I think where that was still pretty strong. And, and when you're the cutting edge, maybe there's a purity to that. And then the second generation, the yeah. second wave kind of just wants to be um, in yeah. the game, maybe. They take for granted, maybe. Yeah, and possibly. I'm all for, I don't know. All I for artistry and things like that. But there really was a sense of a mission amongst many of these mm -hmm. bands that we did this thing. We're going to go play the Al Rosa because we, we're praying and we're believing for souls to be mm -hmm. saved. And mm -hmm. it wasn't just about the music. And, and we worked at the music. Right, um, and we loved the music, but the music served the purpose of the mission, which yeah. was to preach the gospel mm -hmm. of Christ. And so that that kind of sense in the '80s was a really cool thing. Uh, the bands, not everybody necessarily had that, but there were a lot of bands that did. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that began with Keith Green. Yeah, Keith was our guy we looked to, and of course yeah. he, I read yeah. No Compromise in 1987, and uh, that just inspired me. It, as album. to the music, you know, in the book, he so did that book about him and oh. uh, talked about his life story where he essentially, that was his thing. It was about the, the mission first right. and the music was the vehicle right. to get him in front of a generation right. to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so that inspired a lot of us. And I think he was, well, I mean, Andre Crouch did too, but, but um, Keith Green was much more intense yeah. than... Yeah. about it. I mean, he was driven. Yeah. I mean, really like a true driven. prophetic voice. Yes. Um, of course, taken very young, uh, mm -hmm. but he, man, no compromise. His yeah. music to this day, I'll yeah. listen to his music and oh, yeah. and it challenges your yeah. challenges your walk. It does. Yeah. So, so 
last week, so the connection with Karen and yeah. Pastor Matt here. So back, uh, her husband, Rich, had this place called Heart Song Records over in no. Old Tangy. But he had another place first, but Old Tangy is where, is where I met Pastor Matt. Yeah. And uh, to kind of speak to the real ministry aspect of what they were doing, yeah, they were rocking it out and they were enjoying themselves playing music, but they would come in on the weekends, Friday, Saturday nights, and I was there with Rich and some others, and we would pray over them when they would go out because you know they would go into different venues and we hit the streets. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was kind of cool. We go in Friday nights, hit the streets, and witness till about two or three in the morning. We, you know, we were long-haired rockers and go out there on High Street and preach the gospel and pray for people whether they liked it or not. And we had zeal, not much wisdom, but mm -hmm. um, it was a real movement. And and when you talk about Rich Fowd, he he did a radio program um, and knew all of these guys, uh, but his heart was for you know, that next generation really having an encounter with God. And he used the music uh, to really inspire that. And so to this day, uh, there were things I learned there, things that got in my heart, uh, even as a pastor now, uh, that go back to those, you know, times when an, a person just, because we love the music, invested in us. Mm -hmm. And um, man, God touched our hearts. And so many of us today are still serving God. So it's a great era. I mean, I... I listen to all of this, and you know, it brings back so many memories. Yeah. And I've seen all these guys in concert, played with a lot of these guys. It was just a really special and great era, it really was. Cool. Well, Doug, why don't we close in prayer, and uh, we'll get going. And I'll maybe just play some music as we go. So, okay. Father, again, we give you thanks for all that you have done, for all of music, for the this great gift that that you have bestowed upon us and we give you thanks for that we ask that you go with us as we go back to our homes tonight and to our our work tomorrow and whatever we have to do but may we shine your light in all ways in jesus name amen so next week we start the 90s all right we'll be in touch